are ready to start. Good morning. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. We are glad to welcome you at uh, the global conference, which is called Aquaculture, a driver of global fish production. It is the third day of our forum today, and um, we are working offline again, and um, it is in incredible and very valuable for us. And you know well that aquaculture nowadays uh, virtually equals um, classic fisheries in volume, and fish and seafood uh, is in highest demand on the international markets, uh, according to FAO. The numbers of uh, experts of fish and seafood exist, ex exceeds all the experts of uh, other protein sources, and uh, 221 states are engaged in this market, and uh, it is growing continuously and uh, very fast, and aquaculture plays an important part in this process. We are glad to welcome at our session the representatives of governments, uh, federal authorities, the representatives of businesses, of Russia, and also our foreign partners. Uh, let me introduce use the participants of today's session. The head of uh, the Federal Agency uh, for Fisheries, Mr. Ilya Vasilievich Shostakov. The head of Rosselhoz Nodzorov, Mr. Sergei Dankvert. Deputy Director from Fisheries and Aquaculture Department, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, Mr. Uh, Odun Lem. Minister of Fisheries of the Faroe Islands, Mr. Jacob Westergaard. General Director from Director General of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of the Republic of Turkey, Mr. Mustafa Altug Atalay. General Secretary, Network of Aquaculture Centers in Central Eastern Europe, Mr. Peter Langel. Co-founder and uh, CIS director uh, from Finfarel, uh, Mr. Pekka Vilyakanin. The head of the Center for Industry Expertise um, from Russian Agricultural Bank, Mr. Dalnov, and uh, co-founder and CIS director Aqua, from Aquamoth, uh, Mr. Leonid Goldstein, the CEO from um, Ruski Lossos, the Russian salmon, Mr. Tikhonov. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, we have two hours was to understand how in this space, taking into consideration the current realities, um, the aquaculture will be developing in different aspects and on different scale. Let's start with the Russian Federation. And the first question I'd like to ask to Mr. Shostakov. Uh, Mr. Shostakov, two years ago, when uh, we opened the Day of Aquaculture, we noted that Russia produced uh, approximately one-fourth of what uh, the EU produces. Two years have passed, and analyzing these figures, I see the following trend, that the volume of aquaculture uh, is almost one-third of what produce, uh, is produced in the EU. And the question is, thanks to what factors uh, this sector is strengthening its position in Russia in spite of the restrictions that we currently face? Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you here today. And it's nice to see that at uh, the morning session on the third day of the forum, there are so many people. And now we went around. Uh, uh, expo and uh, it functions really well. 
it's great to see that. And answering your question, first of all, I'd like to say that we are not uh, uh, trying to catch up with the EU and uh, we are not uh, striving to be compared to that. But uh, uh, we have to uh, look at uh, the leaders and to learn lessons from their experience uh, to take uh, valuable outputs from there. And we see that uh, the aquaculture in Russia is growing really fast. And if we think about the figures over the last six years, we have uh, doubled the volume of um, aquaculture output. And uh, we started almost uh, from scratch, so to say. But um, the most important thing was uh, the adoption of the federal law on aquaculture uh, when uh, this activity uh, has become legalized. And um, we worked out the regulatory framework. And also, we got the state uh, support measures. And um, it included subs uh, subsidies for new investment projects and uh, uh, subsidies uh, for purchase of uh, feed and planting material, and also the transparent distribution of uh, uh, the plots across all the territory of um, uh, Russia, also mariculture plots and uh, the internal uh, water bodies. And uh, if we take the dynamics of its development, uh, yesterday the representatives of uh, Rosselhoz Bank showed us uh, 13 percent, but that was uh, the average dynamics over the last five years. But um, in reality, it is growing continuously. And if last year we mentioned uh, 14 percent of growth, this year, um, in the first uh, six months, we have uh, had 20 percent of growth. And if we think carefully about it, uh, that was uh, a really um, a good uh, report at the plenary session presented by Rosenkos Bank. Uh, there is uh, no uh, such um, fast-growing area that can be compared to aquaculture. And when we thought about the strategy, how we should be developing aquaculture and what action plan, plan we have to uh, adopt, which priorities uh, have to be uh, set for us. We have been discussing for a very long period of time, uh, for example, sturgeon breeding. It's a traditional um, story for us, uh, black caviar. But we understood that it's a very complicated business and um, a long-term story, quite hard. That's why we define and identified three tasks to develop the following areas, salmon um, and trout um, farming and mariculture and sturgeon uh, breeding as an indispensable part of all the uh, complex, but uh, not the uh, most dynamically growing. And it was not uh, considered as a main driver. And now we sit here together and uh, we say that uh, six years ago we almost did not produce salmon. And now we have uh, such uh, volumes um, that uh, Norway uh, used to um, uh, deliver, to supply us with uh, 120,000 uh, tons of salmon. And now we produce uh, this volume ourselves. And I think it's a great success and a great progress. And this is the result of all the stakeholders and parties involved, the regulators, the companies, the constituent entities. And I think that this joint work has given us such positive results. Thank you. Uh, international markets are introducing uh, additional restrictions, and the rules of the games are uh, changing quite fast. How uh, should we act uh, in this situation? Uh, please name the uh, principles of security that should be adopted and that uh, uh, companies, exporters should bear in mind. 
The situation that we are currently facing in, uh, around the world in the development of aquaculture and the uh, increase uh, of um, the aquaculture fish that is uh, uh, supplied, uh, many aspects of uh, safety uh, now are in um, the focus of our attention. And it helped us to achieve positive results. And if you recall this situation that we used to have 10 years ago, everybody was criticizing us that you find something in aquaculture fish from Norway. And we were criticized that we were doing that on purpose, that you are developing uh, very slowly, and it's a kind of uh, a cartel conspiracy in place. And uh, I recall Federal Anti-Monopoly Service coming to us to the office to take our computers from us, but they were not able to prove that there was a conspiracy there. But the fact remained the same. Sometime after that, after our cooperation with Norway, we uh, got uh, some letters of gratitude from our Norwegian partners, and they thanked us uh, for paying attention uh, to the problems in breeding aquaculture uh, fish. And uh, they also gave us um, their guidelines and recommendation of the competent uh, authorities of uh, Norway, and uh, there were some uh, restrictions. Uh, um, that uh, were imposed, uh, and uh, there were some restrictions uh, uh, for uh, women, and we paid attention to the fact that the intensive uh, breeding and uh, production of salmon and other types of uh, uh, fish uh, leads to certain risks. So we tried to do our best to eliminate this uh, situation, and in the 1990s, uh, we faced uh, the disbalance, and um, we did not produce uh, uh, salmon, uh, we did produce carp, but then when the living standards were growing and uh, we were developing this market, what was mentioned uh, um, by Mr. Shostakov and um, Federal Agency for Fisheries helped us a lot in that, uh, but in um, reality, uh, nowadays we have the following situation. Uh, we should not be guided by aquaculture enterprises that do not change, for example, water um, will be very difficult. I can't understand how they do that in China and uh, in um, Vietnam in sanctuary um, facilities when they can catch a fish and uh, then um, apply all the disinfection measures and then they put uh, after some t period of time put the fish back there when we went uh, to inspect uh, China, Thailand and Vietnam and we came up with the conclusion that uh, the use of uh, uh, antibiotics um, in order to eliminate the infections uh, that can um, um, be found in water, it leads to serious uh, problems because uh, people consume this fish with uh, antibiotics and then they become resistant to um, the um, effect of antibiotics. So frankly speaking, I can recall the early 21st century. I was the deputy minister at that time and I was invited by the colleagues. The uh, Federal Agency for Fisheries was a separate entity from the Ministry of Agriculture, but we signed veterinary documents to export a black um, um, carrier black eggs, the fertilized one, and they didn't could not understand China, Italy, and asked them why are we selling the fertilized black caviar to other countries? We should do that domestically. And 20 years have passed, and from this uh, fertilized uh, black egg. Eggs, 
we have uh, formed our, uh, so to say, a sturgeon community, and we export that to um, Italy, to uh, China, and uh, what was mentioned by Mr. Shostakov, uh, the sturgeon opportunities uh, should be um, used, and this uh, potential should be unlocked, and we are ready to ensure safety and uh, uh, security, and we adopt the same um, attitude towards import and exports, and uh, I can say that as for import, we uh, always um, adhere to uh, the same requirements, and we have all the conditions to ensure the safety and security. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Sergey, from Ross so, let's uh, do some benchmarking with the international experience, and then we will talk about business. As a follow-up of uh, the talk of Alexei, we would like uh, to uh, know how the safety and security issues are uh, resolved in the Faroe Islands. I would like uh, to mention that the whole thing started in 1967. Today, the aquaculture of the Faroe Islands uh, accounts for 40 percent of the total cost of uh, export, and the country is one of the leaders uh, of uh, producing salmon per uh, capita. It is uh, 1.5 tons per capita. And it's a question for Mr. Vestergaard. The question is, how should we raise a lot of uh, fish and to provide the veterinary and sanitary safety? Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to speak about increasing production of aquaculture fish and how we provide veterinary and sanitary safety at the same time. I will focus on what we are currently doing in the Faroe Islands. As many of you may know, the Faroe Islands are in the middle of the North Atlantic. We produce around 70,000 tons of Atlantic salmon per year. Our location offers ideal farming conditions as the water around the Faroe Islands are the neutral feeding ground for wild Atlantic salmon. But being in the middle of the Atlantic also has some downsides. Most farming sites are very exposed to the weather. Furthermore, the small size of the islands means that almost all suitable farming areas are already in use. This means that any production growth must have place either on land or further out on the sea. In the last few years, a consensus has developed in the Fairways farming community. We believe that the right way forward is moving a larger part of the production on land to larger small production. Investments have poured into massive small production sites. Larger small sites reduce the time at sea. A shorter production cycle at sea from 18 months to 12 months can increase output by 30 to 40 percent. We estimate that the growth can be achieved within five years. Production on land is technically and veterinarily challenging, but we have managed the transition quite well so far. However, a shorter production cycle at sea also means that farming intensity on the fjords increases. Therefore, farmers are encouraged to move further out of the mouth of the fjords where current are stronger. But this is not without challenges. Whereas winter storms can be brutal and fish health can suffer. It requires constant monitoring. Therefore, new regulations must be developed and implemented. As a side note, I can mention that we are currently not 
focusing on full land-based salmon production. I know that there's much hype around the potential for land-based production, but it's not very suitable in the Faroe Islands. In the more sheltered area, we are looking into closed cage production. Closed cages can mitigate less infection, but the industry is still in a trial and error stage where a better understanding of fish health and waste removal processes is needed. Again, regulators and industry must work together on standards for the best solutions. From my perspective, the best way to regulate industry on veterinary and sanitary issue is to align economic incentives with desired environmental outcomes. One of the main strengths in the ferry system is the flexibility and autonomy. It gives the farming companies to optimize operations. There are no quotas. The authorities have strict focus on veterinary controls and environmental protections. In effect, this means that if a site has problem with pollution in one production cycle, the farmer will have to reduce stocking at the site in the next production cycle. If veterinary and sanitary conditions are met, farmers can to increase stocking. As the industry moves to new production methods, the regulators must also adapt. To include the research community is of high importance in this regard. This is also particularly relevant when we come to offshore farming, which offer one of the major growth potential for the fairways salmon farming. We are currently reviewing application for a major offshore farming license east of the Faroe Islands. As a Minister for Fisheries, my primary concern is whether such a farming site will negatively affect fishery, fisheries and spawning sites in the area. Increasing salmon production with 10,000 tonnes is tempting, but the environmental impact must be minimized. So as you can understand, there's more than just veterinary and sanitary techniques to the question of increasing production of aquaculture raised fish. But at the very least, I hope that our experience and expertise can add to a further discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vestergor. Thanks a lot, Mr. Vestergord, and uh, let's talk about the general picture of the development of the aquaculture in the world. We have uh, Eldum Lem uh, online, and for him to tell us uh, how the aquaculture has been developing in 2020. Mr. Lem, Lem. best greetings and uh, best regards from St. Petersburg. Well, good, morning, Katia, appreciate... and good morning, everyone, and, uh, and greetings from Rome. Uh, great to hear you, and we would highly appreciate your insight about the main trends in the global aquaculture regarding production, trades, and market. Yes, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation, and I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. I'm sharing my screen, but I don't know if it's up yet. Yes, it is. Very good. Uh, so you, you can see the, uh, my, my presentation? Yes. Good, perfect, okay. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, I'm delighted to be uh, with you. I would have preferred to be with you physically like I was a few years ago. So I'm looking forward to normal times and being able next year or whenever soon to uh, be uh, present in, in, in person. Uh, I will talk uh, about the role of aquaculture, about the growth of aquaculture, 
on some of the uh, most important trends uh, that I see now and, and in, in the future. Um, if we look at um, the overall picture, we, we have some main messages that maybe are not surprising, but uh, let me mention them again. The first one is that there is a rising demand for fish and fishery products, and this has been going on for quite some time. There are two main reasons for this. There is uh, population growth and also uh, a strong demand for nutritious and, and healthy food from world consumers as they enter the middle classes, etc. So there is a strong underlying uh, demand for fish. This demand has to be met by, by, by the sector. And this is the strong driver for global aquaculture supply, of course. Um, and also for local consumption of aquaculture products, like we just heard from the head of the fisheries agency in Russia, that uh, more than 100,000 tons of salmon are now farmed in, in Russia. And that is, of course, a, a great, uh, great news. Um, this has also led to growth in world fish trade, both in volumes and, of course, in, in values. So it has not had a, any significant uh, impact on, on prices the, because demand has been so good. Um, and then, of course, there's a global call for su sustainable sector development, not only from the environmental side, the economic side, but also the social side, and especially the social side, the social dimension has also become much more important. FAO is developing guidelines on, uh, so on uh, sustainable aquaculture, and I will mention that just one more time. Uh, if we look at the uh, overall picture, you, you see this famous slide from, from FAO, how aquaculture has really increased uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years. And in fact, if we calculate per capita consumption, in fact, as, as world consumers, we get more of our fish supply for, uh, for our, our food from aquaculture than from uh, capture fisheries. And of course, the situation in, uh, in capture fisheries, the state of stocks could be better, even though two thirds of all commercial stocks that we follow and about 70, 74% of, of, of the commercially harvested fish come from sustainably managed stocks, we still have about one third of fish stocks that are in an unacceptable state of, 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 uh, of, of being. So still there is a lot of potential to increase, uh, not only the sustainability, but also uh, to increase um, the, the catches over time by bringing all stocks up to MSY maximum sustainable yield. Uh, what is then the situation in, in aquaculture? As you know, um, volumes have been increasing tremendously. Aquaculture is in fact the fastest uh, growing food producing sector in, in the world. And this uh, we are expecting to continue. So both values and volume have, have increased. Um, and of course, as I mentioned already, it's thanks to aquaculture and especially freshwater aquaculture, especially fre freshwater aquaculture that has allowed us to increase uh, consumption of fish and fish products at the, at the global level. It's aquaculture, but in particular, freshwater aquaculture, tilapia and many other species. Salmon, of course, is important, but if you compare to carp, um, tilapia and, and catfish, in, in fact, these uh, contribute much more in terms of volumes. Uh, of course, consumption is, uh, is not equal everywhere. Uh, we have world averages of about uh, 20 kilos, but from a nutritional point of view, uh, it, it's worrying that uh, both in sub-Saharan Africa, in many landlocked developing countries, and also uh, some small island developing states, as well as in Latin America, uh, the, the consumption per average is far, far below uh, world averages. And for example, in Africa, because of the expected population growth, we in fact fear that uh, consumption figures will uh, not only stabilize, but in fact, they may even increase, uh, decrease, decrease. And that is, of course, is a huge challenge to the world community. Aquaculture, of course, is dominated by, by one region in particular, and that is Asia, and within Asia, uh, China. But if you look more closely into the statistic, we find large aquaculture producers in all regions in the world, uh, Russia, Norway, and, and many other European countries are, are significant producers and exporters. We have Egypt, 
very large in, in tilapia and, and, and other, other species. We have Chile in, in South America. So we really have aquaculture production growing in, in all regions. The challenge again is uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, despite many very positive uh, recent initiatives. Uh, what about trade? Uh, trade flows, this I've borrowed from Rabobank. It's a wonderful slide showing flows of, of product from producers or, 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 or farmers to uh, consuming and, and processing countries and then uh, back to, to markets. And you can see here Russia, for example, is not only a very large exporter, but also a very large importer. So trade flows and the importance of having open markets having a stable regime of trade rules, which are foreseeable and, and stable and uh, is, is incredibly important for, for all of us, both for exporters and for importers, for example. Um, a few last slides on, on the future. We, con we continue to believe that aquaculture will, will continue to grow strongly. The, the challenge uh, is to uh, permit aquaculture to, to really take off in sub-Saharan Africa, in the small island development states, and in many landlocked countries in the developing world in particular. Aquaculture, as it grows and as its share of overall supply is growing and is starting to dominate, we'll see that it's aquaculture that will drive innovation in the sector. The aquaculture is driving product development, also market development, and new solutions in logistics and distribution. We also have seen that trade facilitates consumption worldwide including in landlocked countries and in small island developing states. But, but overall, we also have some limitations and challenges how to permit this aquaculture development to, uh, to take on. And uh, for example, just um, referring to the head of the fisheries agency who mentioned the importance of having federal or national laws for aquaculture, giving the normative framework and, and structure for how aquaculture development should, uh, should, should take off, uh, the, 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 uh, how to procure investment, how to ensure investors. I mean, all these things have to be in place in order to facilitate aquaculture development. I also want to mention the role of traceability and certification, which also is very much part of aquaculture development now. And of course, in many countries, still there are challenges in governance, in legislative framework and access to uh, finance and insurance. But also there is a lot of aquaculture uh, investors uh, looking into the sector. So there's a lot of very positive uh, news about uh, investors and capital being attracted to, uh, to the sector. The last uh, issue I wanted to mention again, FAO has uh, under development guidelines on sustainable aquaculture. And these are being developed with the inputs from all uh, the member countries of, of FAO. So with that, I, I thank you. I just want to mention that Next year, 2022, is the international year for artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. So another way to, to highlight the importance of not only aquaculture and fisheries, but also the role of artisanal operators within this. And then in a few weeks time, we'll have the global conference on aquaculture in Shanghai, which was postponed from last year. So those of you who can virtually attend in Shanghai, you are more than welcome. Thank you and, and back to you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lim. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Lim, if it's still possible uh, maybe to have translation. I would like to ask you, in your opinion, are there any regions or markets where the um, uh, influence of the pandemia has not affected the value chain for the aquaculture sector? Or, or probably affected to the in the least degree. Um, well, if, if you compare, there may be countries and value chains that are less affected than the others, but certainly all countries have been affected. I mean, our sector, uh, whether it's aquaculture or, or capture fisheries, is so international, is so globalized that the trade flows, transportation, consumers. Uh, the, the closing of, of, of restaurants, etc., has, has impacted uh, everywhere. And of course, in the very beginning, the safety of the, 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 the need to guarantee the safety of, of workers, of fishers, of aquaculture producers, of, of the people in, in retail and restaurants, etc., all this has impacted uh, the sector. So there may be countries that maybe have 
had less, that rely less on, on fish and fisheries consumption in the diet, but still then they've been equally uh, influenced by COVID in, in the other sector. So this has been a really global, global pandemic affecting all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lem. And uh, this connectivity between uh, aspects and the impact of the pandemic uh, on the volatility of um, their consumption markets. Uh, let's learn how are the things with that in the Republic of Turkey. So surprisingly, over the last three decades of the development of agriculture, the country has increased its production uh, 100 times and it has become the world's leader in the sea bars and uh, rainbow uh, trout. Uh, Mr. Atalay, uh, we'd like to learn uh, how the things are, the domestic uh, consumption market of this production in Turkey and um, the production aspect, what has changed? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this uh, wonderful forum. And I'm very grateful that uh, uh, we hold it in an offline format. It's great to uh, see all of you face to face, to meet uh, with our colleagues in this beautiful city. And I'd like to thank uh, the Russian Federation for this invitation. We have a very interpretive but uh, I planned uh, to uh, speak in English, but I see that the translation is very good. I will be speaking in Turkish, and the world population is growing, the consumption is growing and increasing as well, and we have the trend for a healthy lifestyle, and it leads uh, to the increase of the fish protein consumption instead of uh, meat consumption, and uh, this trend is quite clear in the Republic of Turkey and uh, it is actively developing currently and the scientific research uh, shows that the healthy lifestyle is directly linked to uh, the growth of fish consumption in Turkey. Uh, aquaculture has been developing for the last 30 years and over the last 10 years the government uh, has started its active policy to grow aquaculture sector and uh, to expand it. And uh, the sector is becoming more and more important. So we have uh, uh, interests on the part of uh, investors. They want to invest into the sector because everybody understand, uh, understands that uh, uh, it will be growing in future and they will have the profit out of it. On the one hand, we have to be very careful about our environmental resources. Uh, because uh, we can't um, cater with the, the fishery of fish in the necessary volume. That's why we have to develop uh, aquaculture. And now in Turkey, um, aquaculture production all already exceeds the fishery traditional production. Uh, eight, 837,000 tons of uh, aquaculture. This is the volume of um, overall production in Turkey. And uh, the figures are constantly growing. And uh, Turkey has um, their strongest fleet, if we compare it uh, to other European countries. And uh, this fleet uh, is not um, able to cater for all our needs in terms of the traditional fishery production. And the Ministry of Agriculture has made a decision, the Cabinet of Ministers, uh, made the decision uh, to actively develop uh, agriculture and we have to promote it and uh, to promote the consumption of agriculture in the society. And um, the Turkish sea bass and other types of uh, fish are exported in uh, record high numbers in 2020 more than uh, one billion uh, dollars. This is the export volume and 70% were exported to the EU and um, the rest 30% uh, to other countries. Russia is a very important partner and market for us. 
And uh, Russia is interested in certain types of uh, fish, and we uh, try to uh, meet this demand, and uh, uh, we try to be in line with the strict requirements on the part of Russia. Our manufacturers um, obtain certificates in order to produce fish for Russian market, and they actively cooperate with Russian partners. Last year, when uh, we had um, the growth of uh, production, but the consumption was uh, rather low because of the restrictions, and we didn't know what we have to do with the large volumes of fish that we had. And uh, we started an active campaign on our domestic market in order to prevent the losses of uh, these large volumes of fish. The Ministry of Agriculture organized their promotion uh, campaign across all the uh, country with the uh, large um, markets, supermarkets, um, large chains uh, without any profit. So we start, uh, we agreed uh, to activate uh, the consumption of agri uh, aquaculture on the domestic market. The first uh, picture you see the Turkish Minister of Agriculture um, given the information on the, in one of uh, uh, TV programs. Uh, and uh, we started the program to uh, promote uh, the um, uh, growth in the consumption of fish. We uh, used uh, well-known writers, influencers, TV uh, presenters. Uh, children know them, and um, their parents like them. And of course, they have certain influence on uh, them. And through these TV programs, uh, we tried to increase the uh, aqua uh, culture fish consumption on all the channels. We uh, organized uh, with the uh, presenters uh, some uh, programs that explained how fish should be uh, cooked. And we also invited uh, well-known doctors, renowned uh, doctors, that um, uh, told the society about the benefit of uh, uh, fish consumption and its positive uh, impact on the children's body and uh, health. And we organized that within a very short period of time. It took us one month to prepare that organized it domestically. And um, the result was um, the fast growth of uh, consumption of fish on the domestic market. And we were able to save large amounts of uh, um, fish that was uh, uh, produced over um, several months. And we've had the increase of 30% uh, on the domestic market. And uh, now we face the following situation. On the one hand, uh, domestic uh, consumption has become really high. And now we also hope that international markets will be opening up. And uh, we hope that we will uh, continue supplying those markets with our uh, fish. And it will force uh, the growth of our uh, domestic uh, production. Even in this uh, crisis, um, uh, we did not uh, lose a lot in our sector, and we strictly comply with all the sanitary epidemiological measures in order to meet the standards and the requirements imposed by uh, certain countries uh, when we deal with the experts to these countries. And uh, we think that it is very important for us. We would like to continue uh, acting as a leader because uh, uh, it will uh, ensure the healthy lifestyle for our uh, children. And we will be trying to educate uh, our um, uh, society. And the consumption of fish is uh, growing. And we are uh, preserving uh, this uh, consumption rates uh, both domestically and internationally. Thank you, Mr. Atalai. It's uh, a very interesting initiative counteracting COVID pandemic by increasing fish consumption, supporting uh, the immunity across all the country. And it's nice to see real figures, real results that uh, the consumption has grown uh, even under this, uh, this um, uh, complicated situation. When we talk about the production and about markets, it's important to talk about the environment. Let's Let's uh, uh, turn to the EU and uh, Mr. Langwell. 
I think that all of you here today know that the fast growth of agriculture production uh, is uh, prompted by the growth in the demand. Different types of agriculture have uh, different types of environmental uh, load and burden. Uh, Mr. Langwell, which uh, measures are taken by the EU in order to ensure environmentally friendly production? Thank you for the question. It's quite relevant. Over the last two, 2.5 years, the EU adopted um, a lot of strategic uh, documents that will, of course, have an impact on the development of uh, agriculture. And the most important event was the announcement of, uh, uh, late, in the late uh, 2019, the European Green a deal uh, should be uh, translated uh, like uh, the um, uh, European uh, Green Action Plan. This is the strategy of the development for the EU for the upcoming years. And uh, the main priority is uh, uh, the sustainable development. And one of the most ambitious tasks of this uh, strategy is uh, uh, to uh, make uh, Europe a neutrally, um, neutral continent by 2050 and uh, also separating the economic growth from uh, using uh, the um, uh, feedstock uh, and um, um, the EU is um, uh, putting um, its effort into achieving this uh, uh, goal and we are quite uh, serious um, about it. Uh, and uh, we have uh, about one third of investment budget allocated for uh, this uh, topic. And um, the Green uh, Deal itself is more a political uh, declaration over the last uh, two years. Uh, some related strategic documents were adopted. Um, for a separate aspect. As for agriculture, the most uh, relevant one is uh, the farm to fork uh, strategy and uh, also the biodiversity strategy. The uh, farm to fork strategy will help us to ensure the sustainability of uh, the uh, production. Uh, can we please um, see the slides? Uh, yes, they lost my slides, unfortunately. OK, thank you very much. Um, the next slide, please. OK, I will continue talking. So the uh, farm to fork strategy is uh, aimed uh, at the sustainability of uh, uh, production and um, reproduction of um, and also at the decrease of um, uh, losses, the radical decrease of uh, pesticide, the reduction of uh, nutrient losses, uh, fertilizer uh, uses, um, and also the increase of um, uh, land under organic uh, farming. The next slide, please. Uh, biodiversity strategy is in line with the previous uh, strategy in many aspects and its goals increase uh, the um, increase the 30 percent increase of uh, the uh, land and um, um, about 30 percent of um, uh, coherent protected areas what impact will it have on the agriculture uh, area and sector uh, we can see that in the EU, uh, they are strategically planning up to 2030. All the EU members have to work out uh, agriculture development strategies and also operational programs for the development of uh, agriculture. They should uh, meet the principles of the Green uh, Deal and help implement them, put them into practice to facilitate this work. In May this year, the EU Commission um, has uh, prepared um, the um, regulatory uh, framework and um, we have uh, four strategic uh, priorities and the guidelines were uh, provided in uh, 13 areas uh, guidelines both for the EU and the EU member states so national strategies should be elaborated in line meeting those requirements and uh, those recommendations 
and um, many aspects, indicators and uh, goals in those uh, uh, strategies. Uh, there are active uh, disputes ongoing, but we can confidently say that uh, in uh, the next 10 years, the, e the EU will be investing into uh, environmentally clean uh, production, into the renewable energy and uh, related sectors and uh, aquaculture strategy, I know, it quite well, and uh, it has been set as a task. Uh, the time is uh, uh, limited, but I'd like to emphasize one aspect specifically because it is uh, very uh, important, especially for um, Central uh, Europe countries. Uh, the pond um, fish farming can become uh, the industry that will uh, gain from this um, uh, shift in the EU policy. Uh, the EU did not um, understand well the pond uh, aquaculture and uh, they thought that it was an outdated, old-fashioned uh, method of fish farming. Now the attitude is changing and uh, it is becoming more positive. And if we have a look at the priorities of uh, the modern EU strategies, the integration of um, fish farming, ensuring by Biodiversity, environmental uh, protection, the decrease of uh, greenhouse uh, gases, uh, and also the ensure, ensuring the safety of um, uh, supply chain and uh, pond uh, fish farming are quite uh, characteristic of um, uh, Central Europe, and uh, it is completely in line with this uh, concept and with this strategy. These new strategies in the EU can provide a strong impetus for the development of pond aquaculture, we have uh, to use these resources in order to increase the efficiency um, up to this period of time in Hungary and in many countries of uh, Central uh, Europe. We use um, old-fashioned methods of uh, uh, operation, but we uh, have to um, adopt the environmentally friendly uh, methods. And I'd like to talk about two uh, main Main areas, uh, two main priorities in pond fish farming, uh, the extensive and intensive farming uh, combination. There are many technological um, uh, solutions that are um, uh, used uh, for this purpose, and that is how we combine the environmental functions and ensuring their efficiency. Another area quite uh, promising is the so-called multifunctional aquaculture. Many farmers are switching over to this aquaculture. It is the combination of uh, conventional uh, farming with uh, these services like recreational fishing, for example, and it makes it possible to diversify the income and to avoid seasonal nature of uh, profit making. There are large farms uh, with uh, growing uh, output, the services account for 60% of the income. And uh, our statistics uh, shows uh, that that kind of farms m are better off with the lockdown. Opening the farms uh, for the visitors uh, is uh, good for the community, and the communities understand and accept the aquaculture better in this way, which is one of the strategies of the EU. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Landel, for your substantial talk. What are the new framework of the development of this sector, comparing the data that was provided by Mr. Lem, that there is a growth of the fresh fish by 8 uh, kgs. And I would like to turn to business now for them to explain that kind of development from the practical point of view. Sustainable business is not possible without uh, new approaches and uh, innovative ideas. And uh, Mr. Pekka Velikainen, uh, who is not only uh, the uh, person who is responsible for the aquaculture, but he is also an advisor of the Skolkova Fund and venture investor. 
In your opinion, what do we need to take into consideration speaking about innovations in aquaculture? What are the general principles for launching new aquaculture products? Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as I said, I'm here in two roles. Of course, I have been 11 years going through Russia in 106 Russian cities in, uh, while working with Skolkovo and seeing what is happening around Russia. But today, <clears throat> definitely answering to the specific question about innovation. I think that <clears throat> I might feel now like Elon Musk four years ago in Las Vegas when he was asked to speak in the event of the future of diesel engine and combustion engine. And then he said that there is no future. And nobody liked the statement. Of course, I'm not here to say that aquaculture is going to die. I fully agree that there will be a massive growth on it. But I fundamentally believe <clears throat> that there is a big, big change happening here. Of course, it's good. there are good news and bad news in every presentation. Good news is that we are all in good business. The bad news, the bad news is actually, and I must thank you all the colleagues here, starting from Mr. Shestakov and colleagues from Faroe Island, I have never had better warm-up to my presentation because every speaker has touched all these issues. So what I'm saying is that despite it's a little bit messy slide, I personally believe that 2030 in Europe there will be no fish, no aquaculture business who is allowed to, allow, allowed to leave any waste to the rivers, lakes and sea. Not at all. Not 2%, not 5%, I'm saying not at all. And why is that? It's because uh, our nature doesn't survive. Secondly, what comes to the hygiene, what comes to the um, um, fish health, uh, I believe that in 2030 no antibiotics is allowed to use at all. At all. Um, and that is, of course, a big challenge for the whole fish industry. It's, I mean, for all of us. It's, uh, it's not a small thing. It means that a 300 billion industry must make everything again, because today only 0.2% is done in environmentally friendly way. So we are talking massive change. Okay, now then the question is how to avoid being the next combustion engine, diesel engine. Um, what we have been doing, uh, we have been now four and a half years, we have been building a massive gigafactory in my home country in Finland, but it has actually nothing to do with Finland. This can be built anywhere in the world. And we have built also stolen with pride from Elon Musk a term gigafactory. We have built a concept which is building three million kilos of rainbow trout per module, 365 days per year, no seasonality, no antibiotics, no frozen fish, always ultra fresh product, and only killed by the robotics, by the robots, and packaged same day and in five hours to the shops. In five hours since killing to the shops. I'm not saying that we are best in the world in this, and I can tell you, gentlemen and ladies, that this is a difficult business. But uh, after 25 million euros of testing, we are in a situation where we are, from the theoretical maximum, we are in the level of 106%. So we are higher than the theoretical maximum. And uh, it really works. It took really a lot of nerves and money. Even my wife was about to kill me how, much, how expensive hobby this is. But uh, honestly speaking, now it is working perfectly fine. And the food, uh, feed conversion rate, FCR, what all of you are very interested of, 
is now 1.02 with a very precise robotics-based feeding system. What we are planning to do, we are, of course, Finforel is a small company. We are next spring going on the, on the NASDAQ to be listed as a company, but we, are, we have announced um, that we are building, we believe that these gigafactories, which we have now built in Finland, will be built around the world. So we believe that the fish will be, and aquaculture will be grown there where are the consumers. And uh, I have already three years ago, when I met first time Mr. Shestakov, I said that my dream is to make the factory also to Russia. It's now very close to happen, honestly speaking, very close to happen. But, um, but it's not only Russia, for example, in Britain, uh, now Mr. Johnson has a Brexit and they have fish waters, but there are no fishermen anymore <laughs> because the Polish guys cannot come for fishing there. So they have a tremendous challenges where to find fish. Actually, I'm flying through the Finnish sauna directly to London, where is the next event on Monday because Britain is lobbying us big time that we would build first gigafactories in Britain. Very surprising thing is the Middle East, because in Middle East, the diet resist, uh, the, 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 what people are eating, especially young people, are changing their eating habits quicker than ever before. So the country which was, or countries in the Middle East, which were very meat dominated, Suddenly, you can see vegetarian restaurants in Dubai, which is a totally new thing, or vegetarians in Riyadh. And everybody understands that the fishing in that region is not possible because the seas are practically empty. So why I'm saying this all is that, and, and what are the, the most important findings? We believe that Everything starts from the genetics, from the genome selection. Not genome modification, but genome selections. And luckily, in my small and poor country in Finland, our government has 25 years invested on genome selection research. And we are commercializing that work. 25 years of, of, um, of genome selection, in, uh, in, especially in the rainbow trout. Secondly, this is extremely IT technology-driven business. So when we are building one gigafactory, it's roughly 45 million euros. 45 million euros is one gigafactory module. And out of that, about one-third is high-tech, software, robotics, automatization. Which means that we need totally new competencies in aquaculture. So those guys and girls who were good in traditional fish farming we need those, but it's not enough. And coming back to this Tesla story, uh, in that same Las Vegas session, it was asked from Elon Musk why Mercedes-Benz cannot make electric vehicles four years ago. He replied that they don't, they don't have such people. Okay, I'm not as arrogant, but there is a certain truth on it. This needs a lot of educational things to educate people. Regarding innovations in general, um, we at Skolkovo and we at Russian Federation, we have started investing six years ago on agrotech cluster. And I must say that I'm a little bit disappointed that there is so few aquaculture-driven uh, startups. There are, there are something like 75, 85 companies, but compared to challenge and the compared how much of technology is needed, we could still double or triple the number of those because a lot of innovations are still to be made in this sector. And when we are building one gigafactory, we are not buying the technology from some technology supplier because there are no such suppliers. We are buying from several, several companies and we own the blueprint. We know how to gigafactory to do and we are all the time col collaborating with the researchers, universities like in Skolkovo with Skoltek University to do more and research on this sector. And the last um, 
uh, but not least, I want to repeat three issues which are driving innovation. Number one, 2030, which is, by the way, coming very soon. 2030, it's coming very soon. All fish, all aquaculture must be produced in a way that not a single kilogram of phosphorus is left to the sea or lake. The business model where you are transporting frozen fish from Norway or Faroe Island or Russia or Finland to Riyadh will not fly due to the environmental standpoint. People are careful, consumers are very careful on this issue. And thirdly, the best news, gentlemen, ladies, we are in the right business. We just need to change. Спасибо. Большое спасибо, господин Велякайнин. Продолжая тему инноваций и технологий, возможно... Thanks a lot, Mr. Vilakainen. Talking about the innovations, you might be aware what Steve Jobs has said. The biggest innovations of 2020 will be at the crossroads of biology and technologies. Хотелось бы обратиться к господину Гольдштейну. I would like to give floor to Mr. Goldstein. What are those uh, tipping points, crossroads in uh, the developed uh, technologies uh, to in the aquaculture? Esteemed uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like uh, to uh, thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to have my talk at the forum. I would like uh, to express uh, my excitement uh, for the organizers who did manage uh, to host the event in under the pandemic conditions and uh, to appreciate the high level of uh, the event. We've been doing the business for 30 years. The aquaculture has changed. Let us talk about the opportunities and drivers of the aquaculture. There was a reference made today that the population is uh, growing and uh, there is a uh, higher demand that uh, could be met through aquaculture development. There were global challenges uh, like the depletion of the stock, growth of consumption, and uh, the sta high standards for sustainability and the uh, necessity for nutritious uh, food for the population. Quite important issue is uh, carbon footprint. It's necessary to reduce the emissions of uh, CO2 and uh, the pollution and discharges. And uh, another issue is climate change. We should address these issues. And uh, it is possible to do that uh, through innovations that uh, cover the value chain. The fish has been caught uh, from time immemorial. The technologies are being developed, and uh, there are state-of-the-art breakthrough technologies. Unfortunately, there are no more. The, the fish is uh, not that much in the ocean, and the aquaculture and uh, is developing through ponds and uh, cages. New technologies are being applied, and uh, the application of new technologies uh, contributes to the growth. One of uh, the innovations uh, is uh, the recirculating aquaculture system, RAS. And, uh, there are some challenges of the conventional aquaculture, that there are some uh, external factors that cannot be controlled, such uh, as uh, weather, climate, 
flora and fauna nearby that uh, introduce hazards and risks into the aquaculture. Any business uh, faces its uh, risks, and uh, there are risks uh, related to the aquaculture. It's necessary to mitigate them because uh, the requirements on sustainability are getting more strict, stricter. We are dealing with Atlantic uh, salmon, and uh, you can see the paths, uh, the flows uh, of uh, Atlantic salmon moving around the world to meet uh, the demand. So this is uh, the value, the supply chain, and the, the traditional Atlantic uh, salmon raising is uh, a lengthy procedure, logistically complicated and uh, there is a uh, high lead time before the product uh, gets uh, to the shelves. If uh, RAS is used, uh, the supply chain is uh, shorter, the shelf life of the product is longer, and that's what uh, we are doing now. That's why the recirculating aquaculture system has got its uh, advantages, benefits. Uh, there are no external factors, uh, risks, uh, and uh, the impact uh, on uh, the environment is uh, less. Mr. Dampfer has uh, referred to the fish uh, with uh, antibiotics uh, from uh, Asia. There are no antibiotics uh, needed and used uh, in RAS, but there are some innovations uh, and uh, technologies to be used. There was uh, a, a question about the interface of uh, technologies and uh, the conventional conditions, but uh, the conditions should be set up when both the water and biology of the fish suit one another. and. Uh, the environment that the fish lives in is satisfactory. And um, our company is actually implementing all those innovations. That's why RAS complexes help us uh, to uh, decrease the environmental negative impact and also meet the growing demand. And on the other hand, for the complex to function properly, uh, you can ask me where you should, uh, whom you should contact. Uh, we have been in this business of, agricul uh, of aquaculture for 30 years, and uh, we build uh, facilities at any place with any climate uh, conditions. And these are the projects that have been already implemented. Uh, some of them are ongoing. Uh, we have R&D center and also the training ground uh, where we um, uh, train the personnel. It's very important to have uh, high qualified trained uh, personnel and specialists at these complexes. And uh, we um, achieved very good results in uh, raising salmon. And um, now we have a project in Russia in the Vologda region. I'd like to uh, welcome here our partners. We are building this innovative uh, complex together, and it is innovative not only from the Russian point of view, but also from the global point of view. And uh, hopefully next year we will be able to show you how it already operates. These are the examples of our projects. Uh, for example, the project that was commissioned in uh, Canada, another project in the U.S. Uh, the complex is planned uh, to have uh, uh, 15,000 salmon. Uh, we can breed not only salmon, but also trout. Uh, in the Far East, for example, the Grupa complex. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'd like to wish success to all colleagues in all their work. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein.
Getting back to the topic of agriculture and its development in the Russian Federation, we should note that uh, uh, the Russian agriculture um, has um, had a new impetus for development five years ago. Uh, from, mis- from the report of uh, Mr. Shostakov, we learned about that. And observing uh, the development of agriculture in the Russian region, we see that uh, it has uh, social and economic economic impact in certain regions of Russia. And now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Tikhonov, from the point of view of uh, business, can agriculture act uh, as um, a driver uh, in some regions? There are some regions where um, people like uh, eating fish and in some regions where the traditions um, are not so um, widespread. Good morning, dear colleagues. Mr. Shostakov, I'm a practitioner in this industry, and I'm the head and general director of uh, the company that has been in this business uh, since 2005, in the Sea Waters. And I'd like to uh, present our company, Russian salmon, and uh, I will also talk about uh, specific aspects of our work and uh, uh, our interaction with other um, stakeholders of the industry. Our company is located in Mormonsk region in Pachinsky district, and um, we established it in 2005. Nowadays, uh, we have produced more than 50,000 tons already. We had uh, gone through some complicated times as well as good ones. And throughout our history, we achieved um, results of um, uh, 14,000 tons per year. This was uh, the maximum result that we got. And as of today, um, over the last six months, we produced about 8,000 tons of the ready-made products. As a company, we work under conditions that uh, can lead to certain risks in terms of safety. And I'd like to reiterate what um, Mr. Packer has said that um, now we are emphasizing the safety of um, the uh, produced and manufactured products uh, and uh, also the quality of water is a priority for us and like to explain what I mean. The water that we uh, have after the fish is uh, killed um, can pose a serious threat and a serious risk and in our plan for the development uh, we will be building the new plant of the new format, so about 1 billion rubles will be invested into this project. And uh, there we will have uh, the state-of-the-art treatment facilities, and uh, we will have four phases of um, uh, treatment, and uh, we will be killing all the uh, viruses, and we will take uh, fresh water, sea water, we clean that out, and uh, then uh, we use that exactly at our facility. So let's continue. As of today, the slide shows it. We have uh, uh, four operating uh, facilities, um, fish farmings and um, up to uh, 7,000 tons per year. And our plan is to produce 25,000 tons. And uh, this slide demonstrates the licenses that we have for certain plots. We are a part of Baltiski Barrick group of companies, and that uh, allows us to safeguard ourselves um, from the point of view of processing. We sell uh, both feedstock and the feedstock for um, our uh, company, and then we produce uh, and uh, put that onto the market. So this um, I have already told you about. 
Last year, we obtained uh, the status of the resident of Act Arctic Economic Zone, so we um, got um, some preferences and incentives, and uh, it will help us in our future, and um, we will um, build the new uh, plant with the use of RAS uh, system with um, a close type of water supply system and the processing uh, plant of the new class, um, what I have already mentioned. In general, what, what else uh, I'd like to mention, like to quote Mr. Shistakov, we are ready to continue our development. We, as an industry, are expanding and we are growing really fast. And we are a cluster that um, will ensure very good future for aquaculture. And in Murmansk region, um, we uh, um, have Gulf Stream, stream and um, these conditions are quite favorable for raising and breeding Atlantic uh, salmon. And this is the only place like this in Russia. And we are expanding and we are growing in this cluster. If we take all Russian agriculture, uh, we um, are a dominating actor and player on this market. Uh, Mr. Shostakov, thank you very much for the support that you rendered to our enterprises. And we are ready to give certain part, certain share of uh, our work to the market of our pro products. And concluding my speech, I'd like to say that we have certain influence on the social part and social life of the region. Um, the place uh, where we are located, uh, we have an impact on the support for the society. We have about uh, 260 jobs that we offer to the uh, residents. And some of these uh, uh, specialists are quite unique. We train uh, them ourselves. And uh, um, you cannot find them anywhere else, only tower facilities. And uh, our plan includes uh, uh, interaction with regulators, with uh, um, educational institutions uh, that will be uh, ready to uh, train and to educate the specialists that we will need in future using the Norwegian practice. So we learned our lessons from them. But we are ready to do that uh, ourselves, as I've uh, already mentioned. Uh, it's like uh, the input substitution factor that plays its part. And like Igor mentioned, uh, we have to thank Norway. We have to thank this situation with the sanctions because we have been given this opportunity to enter the market to show what we can really achieve. And um, concluding my speech, I'd like to say that uh, we got the opportunity to speak at uh, today's conference. Thank you, Pavel. It's nice to hear that uh, aquaculture uh, has a very positive uh, uh, influence on the life um, of uh, the regions. And uh, uh, what about um, the general share that aquaculture has on the Russian market? I'd like to ask Mr. Dalnov, you are the head of the Center for Industry Expertise from Russian Agricultural Bank. Can you please share your view uh, of um, uh, this matter and uh, give us your forecast of how the things will develop in future? I'm glad to uh, be the last, almost the last speaker of uh, this uh, uh, session and probably sum up what has been said. Mr. Shestakov called us uh, not to have a look at the EU, but if we uh, want to celebrate our success, we should do that. And uh, according to um, FAO, 23 kilos per capita. And it turns out that uh, Russia is already consuming 
consuming more fish than the EU and uh, North uh, America. And what the, uh, the indicators that we saw in the table and the rates of consumptions are growing. Uh, very soon we will exceed uh, uh, 24 kilos per capita. And I'd like to draw your attention to the following aspect. We have been talking about um, the benefits of it, that it is a, a very good balanced thing and a balanced diet. Why is it like this? If we have a look at um, different groups of products that we are consuming and uh, we compare some figures and indicators, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, we um, uh, consume a lot of um, uh, different um, um, protein and um, the protein that uh, is not uh, very healthy and fish will help us to make our diet uh, more balanced one. And uh, why are we talking about some specific uh, figures? It will help us to uh, improve uh, living standards and to increase uh, um, uh, GDP with um, uh, the longer life expectancy. A lot has been uh, discussed. Uh, for example, yesterday we talked about uh, who had to promote uh, fish consumption. And we have seen a very good, excellent example uh, from the Republic of Turkey. And the consumption reacts quite uh, fast to some campaigns. Uh, and these campaigns can be uh, organized uh, by field-oriented uh, uh, unions and uh, different authorities and organizations. I'd like to say that if we do not do that, we will have the shift of um, consumption towards where their marketing budgets are, and we know where they are, and um, with the high processing and um, natural uh, products will not be in high demand, and uh, we will not say whether it is a bad or a good thing, but uh, um, then we will have um, the uh, growth of um, um, the consumption of um, different um, nutrients that are not so uh, good for our health. And aquaculture is a driver for the consumption of fish in Russia. And uh, it's a very good thing due to uh, different reasons. Mr. Shostakov has told us uh, about the dynamics, about the progress that we have uh, made. And uh, uh, we have about two to three uh, kilos uh, per capita, and then we will be exceeding four kilos if we compare that to other industries. Uh, it's comparable um, to the poultry and um, also the mutton. And uh, what uh, uh, to talk in mutton? And uh, what are the positive factors? It um, uh, evens the consumption of fish in different regions. Uh, we mentioned that uh, um, it um, varies in different uh, um, regions, uh, like in Magadan, it's a um, high indicator. And uh, in Buryatia, for example, it's very low. Aquaculture helps us to balance that and to make our consumption picture a more sustainable one. And um, by int intuition, we understand that that the diseases in cattle can be quite different. And these problems uh, do arise in different countries, also in the developed ones. And um, there uh, can be um, the reduction uh, in the supply of uh, meat. And agriculture gives us uh, uh, a chance to um, uh, preserve uh, a high level of consumption of protein. And we've talked a lot about the pandemic and law on supply chains and um, in uh, um, aquaculture, we see a more local and uh, shorter uh, supply chain, and it is more resistant and resilient uh, in terms of um, their influence of uh, uh, pandemic. And um, what we saw in the EU, in the EU with um, the seasonality, the workers that were gathering uh, fruits and vegetables, the shorter the supply chain uh, is, the better. Also, it has been mentioned that aquaculture is the development of agricultural lands. It has been mentioned that we are having more jobs. And also, aquaculture uh, provides a very uh, good um, uh, connectivity uh, with um, restaurants. 
uh, restaurants offering uh, fish, and uh, it's uh, quite uh, an attractive uh, element. We say that uh, in the remote uh, areas in villages, uh, there is a need to have schools, hospitals there, but also we need restaurants and cafes there. And as for the feed conversion ratio, it has already been mentioned as well. And here, uh, it's also about the sustainability of uh, production processes. And um, uh, aquaculture requires uh, less ingredients of the feed. And these ingredients are not uh, very expensive. And what um, the bank is ready to do, we do understand that the development of agriculture is a good thing for uh, consumers. And it's very good to see that uh, uh, their interests um, uh, coincide both for the banks and for uh, consumers. And agriculture is uh, the fastest uh, growing industry, um, the protein. And uh, it's about 13% um, uh, of uh, average um, uh, growth rate. And uh, we have very good expectations there. So we are ready to invest into the development of aquaculture. And uh, about 60 billion will be invested in the upcoming years. And we are ready to make uh, aquaculture a very um, important uh, sector. And uh, simultaneously, in parallel with that, we will be able to improve uh, the diet of the population. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. We have uh, some time for Q&A, and I would like to, uh, to give a chance uh, to the audience some questions from the floor. Pavel Alexandrovich uh, has mentioned that uh, there might be a high output of aquaculture to the market. Are there any programs or projects in Russia to make the aquaculture products more popular? Or is it a part as fish products on the whole? Of course, uh, being in the country where we catch uh, 5 million tons uh, of wild fish, and uh, despite the trends uh, of the EU that there will be no antibiotics and no emissions or discharges, uh, etc., we realize that uh, for us the benchmark uh, is wild fish consumption. And that's one of the benefits uh, of uh, Russia. Aquaculture is an opportunity, and what is important about aquaculture is that it is closer to the centers of consumption. And uh, aquaculture is very important for communities. But on the whole, we do not uh, distinguish uh, between the aquaculture and uh, wild fish. We are not going to make specific uh, cult, uh, specific uh, outreach uh, programs for aquaculture. It's unlikely that uh, the ministers uh, we will be uh, having posters and uh, with the awareness com campaign. Pekka has mentioned uh, that uh, 2030 is just around the corner, and so it's quite possible that uh, we will have to do something about it. OK, any questions from the floor? If you allow, I would like to ask Sergey. Sergey has been talking at length about the global trends, and I have a specific professional question for Sergey. We are developing, really developing, we, but grazing aquaculture is developing fast uh, and uh, just a bit of industrial, but uh, the emphasis is placed on the grazing. And uh, we have uh, allotted a lot of water area, hectares, for this type of uh, uh, sea aquaculture, uh, water aquaculture, uh, but uh, we are aware what uh, we, we, what are the challenges, like uh, Faroe Islands uh, or in Chile. So, 
How are the risks in terms of veterinary safety are mitigated? First of all, we have to understand that the issues that the colleagues have mentioned occurred because we do not have a closed cycle and we depend on, on the seeding from outside and uh, infections that uh, we can uh, draw from outside uh, would would be here because uh, we cannot determine the source of infection at the early and or take uh, the uh, sh the vessels uh, bringing in the seeding materials do they have any quarantine are they subjected to quarantine no that's why we will have to develop our own production of seeding juveniles uh, and on uh, and then another factor another thing is uh, the unsatisfactory level of the veterinary uh, services and uh, what they're doing with the aquaculture in Europe vaccinations vac vaccines are not here. It's only now that there is a special laboratory in the Institute of Animal Life Health Protection, and we are just planning to develop the domestic vaccines. We are dependent on imported vaccines at the for the time being. and. Uh, or take, for example, the fo the uh, poultry, and uh, uh, the there are live uh, vaccines uh, that uh, are used in the poultry uh, sector. So that kind of dependence on import, uh, on imported vaccines, uh, is uh, something that uh, we shall avoid. And. Uh, and, uh, I exaggerate, but the situation in veterinary science is such that there is no specialization for fish, and uh, we should have more veterinary doctors that would be specializing in uh, fish. and. Uh, that's uh, another task that we face. Veterinary, f uh, veterinary risks exist at any agricultural sector, and the industrialization to produce uh, meat has indicated that it is not always uh, possible to avoid these risks. It might be the matter of human error. And uh, to work uh, efficiently, we sh the internal control should be in place for veterinary control. And when we uh, talk about it, and uh, sometimes the business are not uh, pleased. They say, "Why are your the, the, your requirements are too uh, strict?" So. Compliance is a must, uh, but uh, sometimes not all the businesses uh, understand it. Internal control systems uh, make it uh, possible to uh, stop infections. We have examples uh, when uh, the agricultural uh, facilities uh, uh, suffered a lot because uh, there was just one source of uh, infection. And uh, many countries did manage to resolve this issue. And uh, the uh, challenges in Chile, Chile, well, you are aware about the situation. And uh, it is using the Norwegian technologies. And uh, it, the ownership is uh, no Norwegian. That's uh, why. We have a unique uh, opportunity now. And uh, it doesn't mean that uh, we should gravitate uh, towards uh, aquaculture, raising uh, Atlantic salmon. I think we have uh, more options. And uh, we can uh, use the, the regions uh, with uh, 
plenty uh, water resources to raise uh, different species, not only, say, cy cyprids, cyprins uh, or tilapia. And uh, it doesn't uh, mean that uh, we should import uh, something from Bangladesh or India. We can uh, produce it locally, not only having fresh fish, Cyprinids, by the way, there is a pike perch, uh, for example, quite interesting. We do not cultivate it enormously, but uh, if you take it uh, in Europe, pike perch is uh, more expensive than salmon. And, and uh, while well, we had a speaker from Hungary, he might uh, confirm my words. Filet of pike perch is more expensive over there than salmon. And uh, so we should uh, look uh, for the ways to make the situation better in terms of the veterinary risks. And uh, we have been uh, working together with the business, uh, but uh, still uh, meeting uh, all the standards and veterinary requirements uh, can uh, deliver. And, uh, what are the trends? Uh, because our colleague from Hungary has said that uh, ponds and uh, pens that uh, has been uh, forgotten for quite some time, and you are referring uh, uh, to uh, the recycling aqua uh, systems. In 2030, there will be there will be no antibiotics uh, and discharges. Uh, will it be something that uh, you will be lobbying in the EU? And uh, what shall we uh, what uh, shall we be ready? And uh, what will happen to the 80 percent uh, that uh, is exported from the Asia? Will they be will all the export be, be stopped? Provocation is always a great tool. <laughs> uh, I must say that, first of all, what comes to the ponds as a technology uh, and the way of working, for sure, that is part of the future also in 2030. If the waste is being treated, if it has been taken, the animal health has been controlled in a way that the water can be cleaned. Uh, we are cleaning in our pilot factory about 6,000 liters of water per second. And it, of course, needs a lot of energy, but it's the only way how to handle it when you, we are only using biological tools. But not to answer directly to your question, I, I want to actually comment one other thing which is impacting to our future. And that is, uh, surprisingly, the aging population. The, the, the way how fish is being used is definitely changing already now, today. And it's absolutely true that, for example, in Helsinki, the filet of pike perch is more expensive than the filet of salmon. What else is happening is that, for example, in Europe, and I guess it's the same in Russia, everywhere, uh, there are much, much more households where it's only one person. So on average, in the households, there is 1.4 persons living, 1.4. Which means that for the consumption of fish, we have to have totally new products. And actually, what the colleague from Turkey was saying, it's actually very relevant. Because there are more students, there are more widows, there are more single person living. They don't want to buy a whole fish. They don't want to buy even a big filet. But they only want to buy that part of the fish, what they eat today as an ultra fresh. And that is also something which I don't think everybody is taking very seriously in while thinking about aquaculture. Of course, growing the fish, uh, controlling the environment, uh, fish health is important, but also the scenario how the whole fish industry is driving consumers, giving consumers such a product which are suitable for their daily needs. And that change is fundamentally big right now. I think that in Russia in 2030 will be a lot of rust systems, 
a lot of those. I think that there will be a lot of points here also with the new technology. I think that 2030, I'm planning to be here by the way, 2030 to see whether it's happening. So we can put to the books. So 2030, I think that there will be a battle on genetics. There will be a, a battle of uh, uh, the genome selection, like it is right now in pigs, which is like in chicken. Americans and Chinese are fighting who has the rights of what patents. And um, that's why all the countries, including Russian Federation, needs to make sure that you have a, such a DNA I mean, of the fish, such a, a genome available that you can feed the country. Every country must think about this. And every company must think about it. That's why when I was showing the picture about global gigafactories, one of the important store, part of the story is that we are supplying the fish eggs from our central gigafactories for all factories around the world. To make sure that, like now we have in Denmark, we have a disease on the fish eggs and Danish uh, material is prohibited across the Europe. If that would be the case that we could not get American fish eggs now, all the factories would be empty in 165 days. So these are, of course, massively big issues. There will be a future, Mr. Shestakov. Don't worry. Спасибо, Пека. Вот единственное, на вашей презентации почему-то фабрика в Великом Новгороде... The uh, Gagar plant in uh, Великий Новгород is uh, number five. So are you planning to start building it in 2030 or next year? We are already, our designers are already working on this issue. So we are, as I said, uh, our ambition is to make the company relatively big and that's why we actually within 14 days we are announcing major investment rounds uh, now when we have get the process up and running and uh, we can do up to four of those gigafactories simultaneously so I knew that when I come to Russia somebody is asking why the Russia is not number one on the list it's very first on the list <laughs> Just one thing about the regulations in the European Union. It's talking about the regulation in the EU. So the EU regulations are moving in the right directions. If they take the concept, they have taken a decision that antibiotics should be scrapped, some of them in 2024, the others in 2026, if we have uh, to catch up, we will have to take these similar discussions as well. But we are debating the issue a lot. But uh, at the same time, we realize that the debates uh, will only result uh, re uh, will only result in the loss of some part of the share, and uh, or take the pesticides uh, for example. We have to understand that uh, we live in a global world, and the people are concerned with their health, they take care of their health and take the correct decision. And uh, on the other hand, they work to eliminate the competitors. And the EU is an example. Uh, when uh, we are talking about the composite uh, products, make up of uh, different uh, components and uh, say it is the uh, products of dairy or meat, the Europeans, uh, starting from April, has introduced uh, the system that is being under-discussed in the WTO, but uh, the products uh, to be supplied into Europe, if it is uh, a composite one like uh, pizza, salami, and cheese, all the components uh, should be traced and uh, it should be endorsed, even if there, there are no veterinary certificates uh, to support it. Until uh, recently, it was uh, up to 50%. Uh, if uh, 
and the veteran certificates uh, should uh, cover everything if uh, the meat and milk is included. If uh, the milk is less than 50 percent, the producers uh, should uh, present the declaration. And uh, you have to declare that uh, the producer meets all the requirements. Uh, the IC should meet uh, the standards. And uh, uh, with uh, the antibiotics, it is some 250 or 300. And uh, so talking about the competition, and uh, uh, that is all done uh, to make to avoid the, the competitors. And that's why the Russians uh, cannot uh, export it uh, over there, because uh, there is uh, no underpinning of the the documents and if you t take uh, if we, we intend uh, to deliver something to europe you won't be able to do that uh, even uh, say bread is included it butter where is the butter from okay all uh, the uh, Enterprise uh, should have the certification, so the competition is uh, quite uh, high, and uh, that's why if we do not uh, be prepared uh, for it, we should work uh, hard. Like uh, you won't be able to supply something if you're using the antibiotics, and those are not registered in the U.S. And uh, we have been uh, talking about those uh, issues for quite some time, but uh, we are too slow in implementing it, in applying it, and uh, that uh, will result uh, in uh, losing the, the share of the market. And if we meet the requirements, then by 2030, they will change the requirement and they might say that uh, the fish uh, should be standard size and the color should be, well, a definite uh, color. And uh, take the fish uh, products, uh, for example, and in the EU, they would like uh, to get the share of the premium market, but uh, if they uh, wish, they uh, stop the uh, products uh, from uh, the Asian market, for example. They say, for example, well, the production is not sustainable, you are, there are many poachers, but if they need some products, uh, they will just uh, make the requirements miles. You're absolutely right. But this is um, a similar situation with the Germans uh, when uh, Europeans say that uh, it should not contain any of them. And But I know the system and uh, how they check it. So I'd like to say that you are completely right that the competition forces people to make up many uh, nuances. And you know that in Brussels, in the EU, they have uh, so many officials. And uh, um, hopefully, in the EEU, we will not have so many officials. And uh, uh, for example, if we take uh, tomatoes and cucumbers and uh, would like to export that to um, the EU, and they specify specific uh, size of tomatoes and cucumbers and we do not have uh, um, the understanding of quality and size in our legislation for tomatoes and uh, uh, cucumbers. But uh, they did that before us. And they limit uh, the um, uh, products that can enter their market, and uh, it reflects the approaches uh, that are adopted there. And if the products are competitive, they will not let them in. Allow me to we'll sum up our discussion, uh, running out of time. Uh, we um, were talking about the EU and moved away from the topic of agriculture. I think that we have had a very interesting discussion today, um, very different trends in terms of the development of agriculture. And in Russian Federation, we have uh, diverse trends as well. But uh, we are a very huge country, and we have uh, um, a lot of different specific features, and we have to develop all those directions that we um, discussed, the grazing, the industrial agriculture, mariculture, and all the other areas. And in this regard, if we 
wrap this session up that for Russia, aquaculture is a driver and a global driver uh, as well in the um, uh, fishery of uh, the Russian Federation. And that's why I think that uh, uh, probably we will not be talking about uh, aquaculture um, every year, but maybe in three to four years, we will be able to say that we um, uh, have doubled the production again. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Уважаемые коллеги, в 14.00 в этом же зале мы продолжим.